The Angry Chicken is a production of AMove TV. Bookmark AMove.tv for more gaming and esports shows. The Angry Chicken is directly supported by listeners like you via patreon.com slash TAC. podcast about Hearthstone, Heroes of Warcraft. This is the Angry Chicken. Welcome back, everybody. This is the Angry Chicken. I'm Garrett Weinzerl. Joining me as always is Willie Dills Gregory, Jocelyn Moffat, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just trying not to do some cheesy talk like a pirate intro because it's also pirate day and you can get 100 gold for logging in. Yar, you stormy intro, matey. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Whose idea was this, anyway? Uh, I love the... I, 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 what was really fun was in my head just then. I, I pictured Jocelyn, like, storming a boat as an actual bloodthirsty pirate, and Dills' reaction in this play to be, oh, God. <laughs> just that, <laughs> it, just a really nonchalant, like, oh, God, here we go, pirates. Uh, yeah. Guaranteed uh, on the stream tonight, someone's gonna try to like donate and say, "Okay, talk like a pirate for a while now." I'm like, oh man. Yeah, I was uh, one line. That's it. That's all you get. <laughs> I mean, let you know, it's one day a year. I think you can. Uh, I think you can get in the into the pirate spirit deals for uh, for a few hours. Sure, maybe. Definitely we'll for a hundred gold. <laughs> I think we need to we need to expand it. Like, why do pirates are the only ones who get this? Where, where is like uh, talk like a Yoda day? And uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> isn't that like May the Fourth? Mm, is that part <laughs> of that? I don't know. I don't know. I feel it's... like everyone talks like Yoda on Star Wars Day. <laughs> uh, yeah. I feel like everyone talks like Yoda all the time because I have the correct <laughs> friends in my life. Uh, <laughs> every day is May the Fourth for real Star Wars fans. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah. If you're listening to this, like as we record it, or shortly after it's posted, and you haven't logged into Hearthstone, go and do that. Get your hundred gold. And if you're listening to this a day or any other days other than 365 days from now, since it was posted, you're out of luck. Wait until next year. I think. Maybe maybe they'll maybe they'll give us a one yeah, day grace period. Yeah. This is the first time they've done it, right? Yeah. So it maybe it's a one time thing. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? We'll see. We'll see, uh, but yeah, what's what's new with you guys? I um I was very delighted to go on on Reddit this week and see uh, an FX artist for Hearthstone talking a lot about their design philosophy behind golden animations. I saw this too, obviously after you put it in the notes, because you're much more up on the artsy things than me. But uh, it was really cool. I love when they give us these little like tidbits behind their philosophy on certain things, whether it's card design or whether it's the artistic style. Like, going to admit, there are some golden cards that I kind of look at and I'm like, oh, that one looks really lame, or oh my god, that's the best thing ever. And so the fact that they actually have a philosophy of how they do that, I'm like, man. They have a rule book for everything. I love it. A this. loose rule book, but a rule book. <laughs> yeah, if if folks out there, if you if you missed it, it it came about because there was a, a popular upvoted post that was basically saying, "Hey, why is Valyria and uh, and uh, Druid Malfurion McPants uh, so boring in their golden animation compared to everybody else?" And uh, FX artist, and I'm going to butcher your name. I, I apologize, but Hadija. How did you something of that nature? I'm so bad with names. Anyways, uh, got in there and gave a ton of information about kind of what goes through their head and also reasons why maybe things like people like Malfurion and Valera don't have as shiny animations compared to someone like Jaina uh, because they're they're not magic wielders. And also Malfurion is just standing there shirtless. He doesn't even have a cape that they can animate. They have literally nothing. He's not wearing armor. I found that hilarious. <laughs> well, he does I mean, he does wield magic. Hair. Right? I mean, he's a druid. Yeah, but Druids it's... Druids wield magic. You yeah. can just have, like, leaves falling around him or things like that. Like, Which he did uh, have stuff. originally, right? There's stuff you can do. <laughs> yeah, but it's... I don't know. Uh, I, I, I get what uh, I get what, what, what he's saying here, because, like, arcane magic, so much more flashy, and there's runes and stuff like that. And also, Jane is wearing a robe, which is flowy and whatnot. Now, Furion's just, like, a, a shirtless 
hippie in the woods. <laughs> well, and he used to have a lot more effects around him, like Dilji mentioned with the whole like leaves and stuff. He used to have leaves falling behind him, leaves falling in front of him. And I mean, they even said in the post, like it really took away from the hero itself, which should be the focus. And they like to be subtle on hero portraits, which... I love, I'm glad that the hero portraits don't like actually move or something because I feel like sitting across from that and watching it for the whole game would be very distracting. <laughs> yeah, I can understand that. It makes that, yeah. that, that makes sense as well. But um, I don't know, animate some bars of soap. He looks like he needs a bath. You do <laughs> probably want to limit the things that are static on how much movement they have too because it also, I don't know if you've had this experience, but on my iPad, which I have an uh, iPad mini, but it's, second generation ipad mini i think so at this point it is getting a little old and if i play golden cards i notice it chugs a little bit or if i mm. go to a screen of my collection that has a lot of golden cards on it all of a sudden it chugs a little bit there too so it definitely creates a couple of problems as far as, as you know just how your device works when you're and a lot of people i know play hearthstone on really old devices because it's one of the games they can play on it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to be able to play a, a sweet game of Heroes on a really old <laughs> laptop or something like that. So, you know, a lot of people do kind of go to Hearthstone on their older machines. And, yeah, if you make them a little too much and it's a minion or a hero, that mm -hmm. can cause problems. But think about, like, in Tomb. Uh, in Tomb had, the like, the be I think the best golden animation so far of anything I can remember. Uh, had, like, the shaking and then the things started to crumble and then the door opened and you know, light started to come through. There's a lot going on there, but that's a spell. Once you cast it, it's gone, right? Yeah. So while it's sitting in your hand and it's kind of small, it might be there, but it's not going to sit on the board for the next three or four turns, right? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And also, all I'm learning now, Dills, is that uh, next when we're at BlizzCon and I challenge you to a Hearthstone game, if you're on that particular device, I'm going to make sure to load my deck up with Goldens. All the Goldens you got. All of them. <laughs> All the goldens I can find. Hope for the DC. It'll be a terrible deck because I don't have a lot of goldens, so it'll just be a lot of cheap cards. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was funny because it like my what what happens with my iPad is that it works fine for about three games, and then I notice it starts to struggle, mm. and then if I try to queue another game, I might just it might just crash. So I always mm. have to kind of turn it off and back on every like few games, but it's fine. I put up with it just because it's so convenient. Yeah, trials and tribulations of old mobile devices. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah, it doesn't even. It's not even that old. It's like, I, I guess it's like four years old. So that's kind of old in the world of mobile. That's devices, ancient in tech. <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, my my iPad's about four years old. It's not a mini, but it's getting up there. That might explain the random DCs or the fact that if I try to type to anyone in Hearthstone while I'm on my iPad, it is a coin flip whether that game will stay running or not. <laughs> yeah, I, I never build decks on my iPad either because I've actually gotten to where I have 28 of 30 cards in there <laughs> and then it crashes and when I reopen it, the deck is not there anymore. It's that, completely empty. Without that a doubt. Sucks. My yeah. single favorite thing about deck coats. Mm. Is if I'm in bed. Oh, it, yeah, just instantly into my iPad. Yeah, it's great. iPad equals lazy Hearthstone for me. So if I'm on my iPad, I'm not trying. I'm not sitting there theory crafting. I'm not teching my decks. I'm, I'm going online like, I want to play something new. This looks interesting. Copy. Blah. Awesome. Love it. Because for the same reason you said, it just crashes every time. So... Uh, well, before we get into news, uh, we have a sponsor to thank for this episode. HelloFresh.com is back sponsoring episode 228 of The Angry Chicken. If you are somehow unfamiliar with them, they are the meal kit delivery service that makes cooking fun, easy, and most importantly for me, convenient. As I've mentioned on the show many times, I am uh, awful at being an adult when it comes to eating. So uh, before uh, HelloFresh started sending ready-to-cook meals in a box to my doorstep, I pretty much was, you know, it's like, Taco Bell every night kind of situation. It's no good. It's not healthy. Yes, it's kind of tasty, but it's not, not healthy. And you get to you get to be an adult and in, impress your significant other by actually cooking a fresh meal. Um, so go check them out. They're over at HelloFresh.com. Each week they have new recipes that will be delivered directly to your doorstep in an insulated box. And listen to me, it has sat outside on my doorstep a while in the heat of Florida. It's still cold when I open it. It's delightful. Um, so give them a try. You can actually get $30 off of your first week of deliveries by going over to HelloFresh.com and entering the code TAC30 when you subscribe. And we'd like to thank them for their support and uh, for helping keep me at least moderately healthy. 
Well, all right. Let's move on to this week's Hearthstone news. Good news, everyone. As the old iPad that struggles to play Hearthstone also struggles to play a bumper. Uh, Obviously, the big news this week is that patch 9.1 is live. We're not going to talk a lot about it in the news rundown because we already talked about the changes. But we will... It will be the focus of our strategy talk in just a little bit here. Uh, we'll go over what decks that we're seeing rising up, and that's what we're going to be talking about just a little bit later. So let's move right along into HCT, which took place this past weekend and had a myriad of issues, um, which sadly aren't really a surprise at this point. <laughs> this type of thing keeps happening. And it's the big talk of the town yet again on on how to fix this. Uh, sadly, it's all community talk. No word from Blizzard as, as to any uh, fixes in the near future for this. Um, but uh, it's, is it weird, guys, that this makes me happy? Because when stuff like this happens, it's just a tournament mode discussion bonanza. Yeah, yeah, I feel like we we talked a lot about some of these issues when we had the whole Buffalo Wild Wings venue uh, news. I guess that was before what before spring yes. preliminaries and uh, yeah like I mean it's just the the issues have just gotten worse and worse and worse and there were so many disconnects and crazy regames and I know Dills posted um, a summary of Amnesiac's comments on this too and I agree with quite a lot of what he's saying and in, in particular not only like the the venue rules but also like the admin rules on Hearthstone's end like who's actually making the decisions there were a couple of regames that were called that I was just like really yeah <laughs> like, it, it makes sense if the rule is literally only lethal has to be on board but yeah. that's really not a true definition of when a game is won or lost necessarily mm-hmm. right because uh you know, there was the game, specifically the game that I think everybody is talking about, uh, which is now I can't remember his name. Lurker, Luker. Was it Lur- Lurker's game? It was Luker. Well, this is the one that yes. happened in. You know, this was top eight, and if he wins this right. match, he actually qualifies uh, for the playoffs, right? So, mm-hmm. so Luker. The one I was thinking of was Flo's game with the with the Lyra and stuff. Oh yeah, sure. Well, well yeah. Luker's game though, he was he was playing Warlock, and he had a pirate warrior essentially to the point where the pirate warrior had one card in hand. Luker had dismantled all of the early game minions that had been played and then DC'd, right? But was clearly in a winning position. The pirate warrior was never going to win that game. Uh, not mm-hmm. in a million years, I don't think. I, I, maybe like one out of 200 times, maybe uh, the pirate warrior somehow finds enough damage. But I just don't, I don't think it was going to happen. But the unfortunate thing is because, you know, his game plan is not load the board up with minions and have lethal on board. His game plan is just remove all your stuff. At the point where he actually has turned the game into a a basically 100% win, he's not going to have lethal on board. So a DC Mm -hmm. at that moment, that's not really the criteria that makes sense in a game like that, right? Is, you know, he's not flooding the board, getting the health low. He's just trying to hold on until the point where he runs Pirate Warrior out of resources. So that type of matchup needs to be understood And uh, one of Amnesiac's kind of suggestions, which I really agree with, is rather than some single admin going on and looking at the game state and saying, well, no lethal on board here. Mm -hmm. Maybe they have a few admins who get together and all decide, is this a game that can be won from the other side, right? Uh, And they they can see the, the hands, they can see everything. They can all get together and maybe have like a quick vote. Uh, And he's like five people who know about Hearthstone. And they can get together and they can say, okay, I don't think that this person can win the game. I don't think this should be a regame. And I, th- I just think that's that's the much better way to handle this because mm-hmm. a single type of criteria like that doesn't cover all of the types of games we see and all the types of matchups we see in, in a big tournament like this. That's very true. And I think I also liked the other point that's been brought up as well. Amnesiac brought it up and I've seen it brought up all over the place is the idea of being able to resume a game from a replay or whatever. Yeah, then it gets rid of this whole problem, right? (laughs) Exactly, because disconnects happen in other competitive esports all the time. You see it when you're watching Heroes, like, I mean, which is another game within Blizzard's umbrella. And, you know, like, every once in a while, they'll go into a game and then be like, oh, whoop, okay, it's paused, or, oh, we've had a disconnect, just hang on a second. And then when they come back, everyone's in the exact same positions. They just start from where it left off before the disconnect. So 
where Hearthstone is a card game, and I would think a lot less complicated than a something like a MOBA. I don't understand why we don't have this feature. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it just seems like something that would be fairly easy to program in or at least recreate, you know, because the cards that are in the deck are technically randomized and I'm not sure what they have in the background to let them know, you know, what the order of them is. But um, mm -hmm. it seems to me that it would make sense that that order has already been determined at the beginning of the at game, the start right? Of the game, yeah. So, yeah, you basically just have to re-piece together that situation or just have the ability in the game to just say, like, oh, someone is DC'd. Uh, this is a tournament style game and we can just, you know, this is not on the ladder, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in like a, just in a friendly challenge match that if someone DCs, you can then, you know, have both players say like, okay, reconnect to game or something like that. Like, it, yeah. it just seems like so, such a no brainer. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, somebody in chat mentioned that they thought it was 1-1. One, one. This He was actually down 2-1 at this point. And then when they regamed, uh, he came back in and when he lost, he actually made a misplay because he was really tilted. Mm -hmm. He lost and that series was over. So yeah. He could have gone up to, or he could have even the series at two two, and then maybe potentially one. And that's that's very disappointing. He posted about it on Reddit, saying, "I don't blame anybody in particular, just that we don't have a perfect system right now, and it needs to get better." Mm -hmm. uh, a tournament mode would fix a lot of this if it was in the game. But it yeah, people but it wouldn't have to get have together to at these places, right? So yeah, it doesn't even necessarily have to be a full-on tournament mode, though. Just like some way that we can resume matches. Like it just it seems so crazy. Yeah. Like. I don't know. It, it, yeah, even like it's... like I said, like these are all friendly challenges, right? Like they're not even they're not yeah. ladder. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 No, I uh, completely agree. I mean, really, at the end of the day, and it's just it's kind of silly that we keep having this conversation. It's it, to me, this is something I see as as just you can't have this if you want to have a competitive aspect to your game, uh, especially when I mean, Blizzard is the one supporting this. This is their tournament that they are putting on they're very aware of the fact that their game has a competitive aspect. It's the most advertised thing about their game, more than uh, the expansions itself or any change to Arena, by the way. Um, sure. So I, yeah, this I, is the most front-facing thing mm -hmm. uh, that, that they provide, really, right? Yeah, the, it, the most people kind of see. There's, there's no other more glaring omission from Hearthstone, in my opinion, um, than any anything in-game uh, to to actually lend e some yeah lend some backbone to esports and I, I don't understand it I, I really don't and at the sure. very least they need to come up with a better system for the administrators like you were talking about dills like at the very least because clearly it's an issue or not a priority to put something in the game itself they need a better way to run these tournaments yeah and it's a it's it's really not fair to the players to expect them to spend you know hundreds and thousands of hours qualifying for these tournaments and then essentially have the player maybe lose a chance at making it to the next step you know and not only that but once they even get there then it's a grueling three days right or whatever mm -hmm. two days of hearthstone uh, that and then all of a sudden in single elimination and then, which well, then I think all, is the and, problem yeah it's swiss yeah, and then all of a problem. sudden single <laughs> limb right when yeah. they get to the last bit and so that then you get a DC series and determines single, yeah. <laughs> whether he actually makes it to the next step. So it's just it's unfair to expect the players to like you're what you're gonna end up doing is the longer this doesn't get resolved, you're going to just alienate these players who are the top players in the game. And they're gonna be like, you know, live I, I know that Amnesiac after this tournament, where you know he works so hard, works so hard, works so hard, this is like the, the second time he's been this close and didn't make it in. He reevaluated if Hearthstone is worth his time, right? Like he loves the game, and he said he loves the game, so he's not going to say the game is bad. But it is tough to ask people to spend this much time and then have something like this happen at the end, uh, or even just draw poorly three games in a row and it's a single limb. Like there's lots of little issues like that. Uh, I would prefer that the Swiss just went to the top four and those people qualified for the next step, and then you you can have single limb from there to decide a mm. champion. That's fine, but it's just weird that all of a sudden it comes down to a single limb to make it to the next step. So it's just, there's a lot of things that are funky about their whole system right now, and I I hope and it's I know that they listen to the community. I hope that changes come sooner rather than later because it's just gonna it's just gonna keep frustrating players. It stinks for the for everyone putting the tournament on as well. It, like it stinks for the players and it stinks for the administrators. If you're an innkeeper or or someone running one of these venues, like you don't want to have to give that news to somebody either. Sure. Like, oh God, no. 
Oh my yeah. god, no. It, it, it just it makes everyone look bad. It makes Blizzard look bad. It, it makes the esport look bad. It makes the administrators look bad. I just feels bad, man. That's Well again, so, and it kind of comes down to or at least it feels like it comes down to Blizzard prioritizing these firesides over like fireside gatherings and getting the community to gather in a place as opposed to actually making their playoffs competitive and focusing on their competitive players because the venues that they've chosen and like I mean I won't even get into the hardware provided actually crashing but even just like saying you have to go to a specific venue when and Amnesiac even mentions and I know I'm not sure where he was playing from but I know the same thing happened at the Boston venue because um, I follow Ricey on Twitter and so I was watching his whole up and down on the weekend too um Forcing players into these venues that are, you know, bars and restaurants is fine-ish, I guess, for, you know, regular play. But when you're doing playoffs, put them in somewhere that has a LAN and a quiet setting. Like, these are yeah, professional players. In. Like, yeah, <laughs> professional being the key word here. Like, this, to me, these summer playoffs were not professional at all, no, which is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, well, they, he even said that once he got to the top eight, they moved to another venue. They moved, yeah. And then he said, "Why weren't we always here? This would have been much better to play it's at because it they were prioritizing playing on good that were plugged in." Yeah, they're prioritizing social and they're prioritizing firesides instead of yeah. prioritizing professional play, and I think that's wrong. Yeah, those should just be. And, and I know they do have two separate teams essentially. Um, you know, I, uh, I actually just got to hang out with with Amy a little bit because she moved to uh, Austin to work for Blizzard and. She talked to me a little bit about what their fireside uh, situation kind of is now. And I know it is very it is separate from the competitive stuff. So the fact that they put them together for mm -hmm. this type of thing and then somehow try to make both things happen is to me a little bit awkward and maybe contribute. So they should maybe just separate those things a little yeah. more. Well, uh, somebody the in the day, chat, by the way, just said something about abusing DCs and people have abused them in the past. That also would be completely fixed by being able to restart games mm -hmm. uh, right. like or just, re, you know, not actually regame but stop but the game at a certain point in, and then just yeah. start it again because there'd be no reason to dc on purpose yeah. if it's not going to get you anywhere right yeah mm -hmm. so anyway uh, I, w I would like to say on the, on the subject of the venue is that the, the venue is more or less irrelevant you have the chance of an issue no matter where the venue is it doesn't necessarily matter that it is a restaurant even though i still think a restaurant is silly um well it's the difference between wi-fi or wired connections right so it's just it's like removing a potential point of failing right failure, well, or at well, least we, making it better we had a wire connection at freaking buffalo wild wings um and it what we we personally didn't have any issues it went really well even though i was crapping on it the week before <laughs> saying this is the <laughs> dumbest thing i ever heard of um it, it went super well and we, we had no issues back you know with the last uh, the last qualifiers that we that we were a part of um but yeah it just as long as the game's going to be online and as long as they are going to, and, and this is, I think, a good thing for Blizzard, let these many people play in these large uh, preliminaries, uh, I think the only real answer is to do something in-game with that reconnect. Yeah, a, a short band-aid right now would be yes. Let's get some type of voting system with the administrators so they can make a judgment call on the outcome of the game. Uh, but for the long term, no matter what we do, as long as it's an always online game and as long as there are way too many people uh, to have a localized uh, event where you fly all the contestants out and maybe actually hook them up to a private Blizzard server, that, that's going to be the only way to really stop these type of scenarios from happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yes, do, do the quick fix for now. But, I, yeah, they really need to get on making the, uh, the whole system run smoother. So yep. it's funny. Like when you watch a Heroes tournament, suddenly everything stops moving and you're like, uh-oh. And then they take a break and then they come back and everyone starts moving again from where they yeah. were. And it's like, that seems like the right way to do it. You're yeah. the same company. Let's yeah. get on this. Yep. Yep. Now, I don't know. <laughs> There's a, yes, uh, as you're writing your emails, we're aware Hearthstone wasn't built from the ground up to be a competitive game, but it is now. Sure. They need to fix it. Yeah. Um, and, it's, and they've had many years now. Yes. Uh, yeah. to, it's been a competitive. We've got three world champions and we're working <laughs> on a fourth. Like that's it's time. <laughs> and a whole lot of very annoyed champions this weekend. Yeah. And this year in general. So anyway, let's lighten it up. On the lighter side uh, of Hearthstone, uh, Mike Denae and Ixar sat down with our friend Cam Shea over at IGN to talk about uh, insane early drafts for Death Knights in the Frozen Throne. Um, and they, they kind of kicked things off by admitting that, yeah, Lord Jaraxxus was kind of the, uh, the, 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 the pool from which this was spawned. <laughs> 
that they they like Draxus so much they wanted to make more cards like Draxus, uh, and that's where Death Knights kind of came out of. Uh, but they decided, you know, to give it a new card type to help with some of the bizarre interactions with something like Lord Draxus. And well, yeah, because he's he's a minion himself when he mm-hmm. comes out right before his, the, yeah. his battle cry happens. So there's so many. Well, I think cool, but apparently they think weird <laughs> interactions that happen. I'm I with just, you. I remember all the different times the community has kind of come out with like, oh, my God, did you realize when you play Draxus and this happens? Like, those are awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I'm with you. I think they're cool as well. At the same time, though, if my DK got like pulled out of my hand, oh, I'd be really yeah. mad. So I'm glad that that's... Uh... Well, and they, I think they have added, like, since Jaraxxus was actually created, they've added so many more ways to kind of do things like that, to, you know, like Dirty Rats and all the other stuff that they've added to kind of mess with your opponent. Mm-hmm. That, um, yeah, it does. it wouldn't work as well making Death Knight's minions in the way that the game yeah. now works like, like the state with of the current Collar, hearthstones and now yeah. there's a whole bunch of different ways to do it but i think w- what this has really done though is just opened up the idea that they can make more heroes more hero type cards and mm-hmm. then they can also make jaraxxus style cards that do kind of fall prey weird, weird interactions right so, absolutely and you can balance around that fact that yeah this is a card that can become just a minion on its own or it can do this other really cool thing mm-hmm. uh we've seen a cut like major domo is obviously another kind of interesting way that they allowed you to change your hero into somebody else i i kind of like the idea that there's gonna be tons of ways to do eventually you know five years from now there's gonna be all sorts of crazy ways to change your hero into something different it makes the game really fun and some of the funnest games i've had recently were playing uh, i opened up lillian voss right and i was like ah, okay it was golden i was like okay i guess i better make a deck uh, so i made like a deck that steals everything right and i ended up in one game and i'm running the the rogue DK. So in one game I played, I turned myself into the priest DK because I stole that one. And then later <laughs> in the game, I turned myself into the rogue DK again. Uh, and it was super fun. It was just like the, the craziness of that game and like the storyline I went down was awesome. So more of this kind of stuff would be super welcome. Yeah. Well, it could have been crazier, Dills. Uh, Valir of the Hollows hero power was once discover a secret from any class. Whoa. And you just press that over and over again and just keep becoming a secret rogue. Okay. Apparently, right. yeah. Interesting. Yeah, apparently that's a thing. Uh, Th- this this one's way cooler, by the way. The one that we actually have now. It is yes. It is so fun to try to build weird and interesting decks around that. Like, you can make mill strategies work again that are really interesting. Yep, yep. Uh, early Deathstalker Rexard hero power was to deal two damage to all enemies. So so he- hero power, not, not battle cry. So just like every turn, he what? can just deal two damage to everything. Yeah, just, that's insane. To enemies, just to enemies. Yeah, that is. <laughs> you just so have a crazy. two mana consecrate every single turn. Yeah. Screw that. <laughs> I would have uh, only been okay with this if he was holding a shotgun in the artwork. <laughs> that's what it needed to be. Uh, zombies originally were able to get minions from any class, and uh, they, but they said that uh, getting warrior taunts were just too weird in their opinion. <laughs> Yeah, the version that we have now makes a lot more sense. Um, and it's still very powerful. So, like, once you actually get there. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it sounds like they were just, like, going off the handle. They were like, ah, whatever. Do whatever. Well, especially with the next one, the Dex- Death Stalker Rexar could craft and summon a zombie. <laughs> That's his battle cry. That was his, like, yeah. coming into play effect. Oh, right when he came into play. Oh, yeah. Okay. Which that actually sounds pretty So he kind of became rad. an amalgamation of all these things. And then- yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, they, I, 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 that's yeah. That's interesting. It's like they, they just had a puzzle and they had these pieces and they just moved around. They're like, well, there's two damage to everything for two mana too much. Yep. What about it's a battle <laughs> cry? No, that feels good. What about the zombies coming to play? Oh, but wouldn't that be cool if you could do that for the rest of the game after you play this guy? All right, let's let's do that. I'm I'm sure it was that simple. By the way, it definitely wasn't yep. months of arduous <laughs> texting and simulations. It was a two step process. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and uh, in case you were wondering, Priest players, yes, uh, they did consider Shadow Form working with Shadow Reaper Anduin, but decided against it. I'm kind of glad. How? Well, like, it would have bumped his damage, right? Bumped it up to three? Yeah. Okay. Right. And if it was, I wonder if you Shadow Form twice after Shadow Reaper Anduin if, Anduin, if you would bump it up to four. 
That'd be insane. And then you play Prophet Velen, and it would be eight. Yeah, and then it's eight. Oh, man. And, and, and it's zero, zero, and you can refresh oh, it. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, it, I'm, I'm kind of okay with that. Like, if you, you can actually pull that, that craziness off, and, uh, sure, why it not? It better cost 10 to play that, that DK then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I've had so many bad losses to Priest lately. I'm kind of like, whatever, sure. Let him hit me for 10. I don't care anymore. Uh, that's great. But uh, go check out more of this. Go read the uh, the full article over at IGN. See some of these uh, these early drafts for Death Knights. Um, always love looking at this kind of stuff. But there is a, there's been a patch out now for uh, just a little bit over 24 hours. So let's get in and talk about it in this week's strategy discussion. Hit it very hard. You want to blow something up? <laughs> yeah, <I'm on. laughs> Time to pay. All right, so we're not doing one specific deck this week. We thought we'd kind of talk about what we have seen in the last 24 hours uh, with patch 9.1 going live. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of curious around the table, what's like the one thing that you, so far seems to have affected you the most? And for, for me, I think it's just how weird it feels playing against a warrior not having to worry about Fiery War Axe anymore. You've actually seen warriors? I have <laughs> N- nothing but warriors and priests since logging in uh, after oh, yesterday. Weird. I was going to say the thing that's affected me is I'm still getting rolled over by druids with flappy birds. So really? Yeah. I haven't seen, I've seen a few jade druids, but I haven't seen any aggro druids anymore. And oh. uh, zero pirate warriors, um, tons and tons seen, yeah, of hunters, priests at all. and mages is what I've been seeing a lot of. So mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, mages are everywhere for sure. Yeah, and there's a lot of people now playing the the DK mage, which is just kind of a control mage that, you know, because for a long time it was mostly the quest mage. I was mm-hmm. trying to just OTK you, and now I'm seeing a lot of this kind of slow uh, DK mage that just turns into Frostlich Jaina and just will never lose from that point because you can't kill them. They just yeah. gain too much health. So it, it seems so far, I mean, it's only been two days, right? But it already feels much healthier. Um the fact that there are just not 50% druids every time I log in is perfect. And I, and I don't want, I think what a lot of people were kind of weirded out by is they expected this was just going to kill druid, right? And I don't think any of these changes were meant to kill druid. It was just meant to bring it in line. And I think it's definitely in line now. So you can still play. If you really like jade druid, you can still play it, and it'll still be a pretty good deck. You can almost play the exact same list. That you had before. Even even keep the innervates in, keep the spreading plagues. It's actually still going to be an okay deck. It's just not going to have, you know, a seventy eight percent win rate or whatever people were having before. Yeah, I, I was that's what I was expecting. So I, I I think some people were just kind of getting in on the fun of being like, Yeah, rip Druid, it's over. It's not the yeah, case. Yeah, Druid's not over. But <laughs> one thing that this has done is it's opened up a lot of space for Rogue and uh, and Hunter. So that's kind of cool. Uh, I actually, I think, too, a lot of people are going away from Murloc Paladin instantly. It's That's still a really good deck. It's just I think you have to build it a little less mid-rangey and board-centric and a little more aggro now. I think you just have to, you know, you throw in the, the Grimscale chums and things like that and go back to kind of kill you really, really quickly. Because you can't do this uh, long range strategy anymore where the war leader is buff and then you get like solid trades. You buff with the war leader and you just go face now, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and so I think that's still a really strong deck. A lot of people, but we're, we're really close to the nerfs, right? So a lot of times, once a nerf happens, everybody just abandons it immediately. And then slowly over time, they realize, yeah, that deck is still pretty good. So they'll <laughs> they'll come back to them. You're telling but, me pirates are coming back, still? No. Well, <laughs> pirates, I think, are still actually okay. I won many games without drawing a fiery war axe, so yeah, you I could know. still <laughs> totally win by just making a rusty hook into you know a five attack weapon. That is still definitely viable. Um, patches yeah, if, is still really good, so yeah, you might just uh, have to adjust those decks and make them a little more mid rangey. If you're a salty warrior player like me, you have to win all of your games with that fiery war axe because you never get it in, a, in your opening hand, no matter how hard you try. Sure, sure. Yeah. Also, now we're starting to see a lot more people experiment. I think with uh, not quest warrior, but so there's there's already a lot of people doing this weird fatigue warrior thing. 
Mm-hmm. But I don't think that's the only way to play Control Warrior now. I think you can still do a Control Warrior with some late game bombs. Um, because the, the weapon you get off of the Scourge Lord is just so good that it helps you just gain control and then you can drop your big boys on the table. So, yeah, I got that today playing a rogue off of a, a Swash Burglar. <laughs> it turned into Scourge Lord Garage. It was That's wonderful. Awesome. Nice. <laughs> yeah, and I, I'm really curious to see. I, I experimented a little bit with it. I want to bring back uh, Elemental Jade Shaman that I was mm. playing right after the Jade Spirit change. Um, I think that, that this opens up that space a little bit more, too, because that deck just got crushed by Jade Druid. So uh, I think now, with Jade Druid just being a little more in line, that deck now can compete again, too. So I think we're going to see we're gonna see like 10 or 12 archetypes consistently instead of just one all the time and then a few other stragglers trying to beat that one. That's definitely how it feels. I'm uh, kind, of, kind of watching everything, my, my own experience out the door. I don't know why I'm seeing so many, so many priests and warriors, but... Watching well, I think around. you're seeing a lot of priests because everyone thought priest was just going to run over everyone. So that's sure. the kind of train everyone was on. So mm-hmm. we're, you know, a, a day after the patch, everyone's just jumping on the priest train. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we just saw uh, purple and that prelims never lose with his priest. So yeah. right after something like that happens, obviously people are going to instantly jump on that deck. Mm-hmm. Get on the bandwagon. Uh, well, around the table, it, again, we haven't had a lot of time, but what deck have you kind of latched onto as much as you can in one day? Uh, Joss, what have you been playing? Uh, so I went back to Secrets Mage, but then I've kind of dropped it pretty quickly just because, uh, like Dills mentioned, it's just there's not that much different. You know, like it's it's kind of got bone mares in it, and that's about it. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same. So I was kind of looking for something that changed a little bit more than the Secrets Mage. So I went with um, the Evolve Shaman with uh, Thrall, the the DK deck. Oh. If nothing else, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> that's the only thing that gets me as close to uh, to Rage as a third or fourth ice block. By the right? way, uh, small un. <laughs> undocumented change in the patch uh, if you evolve into unlicensed apothecary you no mm-hmm. longer take 20 damage or whatever because uh, it was really weird that it worked that way because um it, it it it's like what unlicensed apothecary says is when you summon a minion take five damage when you were evolving you were not summoning new minions yeah, right you, were you changing are changing minions yeah, yeah so you are yeah. transforming them right so right. Mm-hmm. like similar to say polymorphing or hexing something you are turning it from one thing into another it was very weird that that interaction existed so apparently without telling us again pat, uh, patch note steve uh <laughs> the yeah. now that that has been fixed but um so yeah go ahead and and play your evolve shamans without fear of <laughs> randomly taking 30 damage out of nowhere <laughs> Yeah, if any, that's just a, that just gives away how they coded it. Yeah, it's really all it. Yeah, up. basically what they were doing was they were, they were coding it as if they were destroying them and then resummoning them, right? So, mm-hmm. and that, that should not be how that works. Um, nope. But yeah, I think I think I think the shaman because the hex wasn't even a card in that deck. That shaman deck just instantly got bumped up, right? Because it's just it was already pretty good, and uh, sometimes it just couldn't get through like one primordial drake and jade druid or something like that, and that was it. Now with J Druid being a lot weaker, it's uh it's definitely going to have a, a strong chance. Mm-hmm. Yep. Dales, what about you? What have you been playing? So I immediately jumped on that hunter bandwagon today. Um Asmo Dies list is his current list is the one he hit rank one with, I think, yesterday. This is the one that's on uh disguisedtoast.com. But I have a list from I guess it was a couple days ago when he initially did it, and I enjoy it more because it's running Deathstalker Rex are uh, and a mm. bone mare and stuff. So it's pretty similar to this. You still got the two Hydras, still have the Spellbreaker, uh, one Savannah High Main, which I thought was very interesting. You know, it's just one of those cards you always expect. It's so good you just want two of. But the deck is really built around early game pressure, and drawing two High Mains is just never going to fit into that strategy. So it does make a lot of sense. It's one of those cards you, you just sometimes want to get it later on in the game but you never want to have two sitting in your hand at the beginning, right? So mm-hmm. yeah, it doesn't make sense. And you're also looking at a deck here that has two five mana eight eights. So do you really need yes. two high mains as well? No, generally you're going to get those five mana eight eights online and you're going to win the game where you're going to lose from there. Like that's kind of the defining turn, right? Is if you can get those on, they can't deal with them. You'll start smashing face. 
But uh, the the interesting thing about the Deathstalker Rexar being in the deck is that it allows you to still win against decks that have cleared out all of your early pressure, right? So a lot of times if you play this version that he's playing now, this is kind of an all or nothing strategy. This is a much more aggressive type of hunter list. But the one that was you know in there before had that where if they cleared out and and you were kind of at a, a situation where you because you run out of cards too in this deck, mm-hmm. but you could just play that Deathstalker Rexar and then for the rest of the game you will continue to apply pressure right. So it's it gives you a chance. Uh, it's not necessarily a great place to be when you're out of cards and you're spending two mana a turn making a threat, but it at least gets you a situation where you still can win. And uh, and then the other thing too is that deck has the single bone mare, so it allows you to, you know, sometimes at the end of the game have that little extra like push. If I can get a minion to stick, if I can make a stealth zombie beast, then I can bone mare it. I can get that final push of damage through. So I really like that version a lot. I can dig, man. I can dig. I've been uh, I've been playing around with the the double prince rogue. Uh, I originally this is a cool idea for the deck, by the way. Yeah, I, I first I saw AP Drop tweeting about a tempo rogue that he was playing that had just Kaliseth in it, and I was just like, "Oh man, that's awesome! I can't wait to have a minute to." I saw that yesterday before I started playing, and then uh, by the time I got in to make a deck, uh, I saw a couple more things referencing Double Prince Rogue. And uh, if you go over to this guy's toast right now, you'll see Tice's list, and this is such a cool deck. Uh, like any deck that doesn't have card draw, my first thought is, oh my god, I need card draw. Because I've, I've definitely run out of gas with this uh, deck at least once or twice. But I think it's also because I don't know what I'm doing yet. Uh, <laughs> well, you have Swash Burglar and Shaku. That's your card draw, right? Yeah. And then you have some heavy minions. So you just play one minion that turn anyway. That's right. kind of the idea. Yeah, but sometimes you don't you don't find those three cards. And, yeah, uh... that's true. <laughs> And also sometimes you have Firefly too, which is totally card draw. It gives you one more little one too. <laughs> yeah, and also sometimes Swash Burglar bricks, or in my case, it gives you a Death Knight, and it doesn't feel so bad. But um, mm. yeah, overall, this is one of the just oh man, I don't know. It just kind of blew my mind. I was like, oh my god, it's a rogue deck, and it's not it's not a quest, and it's not miracle. Uh, I'm very interested in this, and I hope I hope this is something that sticks and kind of stands the test of time. And it's not something that next week we're gonna I'm gonna be sitting here going, man, I can't believe I ever thought this deck was good. People figured it out. It's terrible now. Well, it's good against the hunter decks too because it it can kind of outpace them. And mm-hmm. then obviously your hero power is really effective for clearing out early beasts and stuff. So you know you're you're not so dead when they get the alley cat into crackling razor maw as much because you can actually deal with that opener Mm -hmm. so i you know i think that's one of the reasons like this deck is going to also kind of rise in popularity is it has a good matchup against another new deck so uh it's it's a it's a cool idea i actually had a deck similar to this that again was inspired by ap drops uh but it was before we were only playing like you said the keliseth we weren't playing the valinar um but the Valinor is great because it gives you the healing that you used to be able to get from a card like a heal bot, right? Uh, suddenly you are able to gain a little life, which is what Rogue always struggles with. Yeah, yeah. But it was, for, it was very similar. Blaze Callers, Bone Mare, Bile Spine Slayers, that kind of stuff. Yeah, and for our listeners out there who may have forgotten what Prince Valinor is, it's the four mana, four, four Prince uh, that has a battle cry where if you have no four cost cards in your deck, you get lifesteal and you get taunt. Yeah. Uh, been yeah. seeing a lot of priests. So. How would we forget pre- the princes, though, Garrett? I mean, come on! Everyone was talking about how powerful mm-hmm. they would be. <laughs> well, everyone's been everyone's been messing around with Keliseth, but uh, yeah. So I, I think we were we were surprised uh, by the viability of Keliseth, but uh, all of us, you know, I, I, know I, I was kidding. I know, I know. I'm still <laughs> in case people are listening and they missed that. The uh, so the the other cool thing about this deck is you got double shadow step, which obviously you can use on like a Leroy Jenkins, right, to get a mm-hmm. whole bunch of finishing damage in. But shadow stepping Prince Keliseth is Gross. real good because <laughs> like I I had a couple games where I played him on two, shadow stepped him on two, and then obviously you can play him again for zero that same exact turn, and uh, so you get double buffs on the rest of your deck. And when you double buff the entire rest of your deck, it's pretty hard to to lose from that point. I agree. I 100% you agree. You could play like a uh, naked Edwin, and his stats are still fine. He's a 4-4. Four, four. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's a 4-4 four, 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 four. for three. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I also found myself uh, shadow-stepping a Plague Scientist in one game, just to double up mm, on Poisonous sure. on the many 1-2s I've been spitting out with Fireflies. And uh, just, to, just to get through some big, big old walls. I actually saw one of those... 
weird like taunt fatigue warrior as you were talking about dills which i mm. i didn't know was a thing until you mentioned it and i was like oh, that's why they played a bunch of taunts and then a oracle what the hell's going on <laughs> yeah they're basically just trying to outlast you but mm. uh yeah this deck can definitely apply pressure before they get to their game plan of never dying right yeah yeah it's uh it can be it can be real nasty the dream is you know coin prince galaseth and then uh shadow step prince galaseth and uh, <laughs> the rest of your game you're just <laughs> dropping big old buff dudes yep i actually had a game uh so my version my version was also running shadow casters before um and i actually had a game where on i think like turn five the guy was at maybe 26 life or something like that and because i had double shadow step and two minions had stuck i looked at the board and i kind of thought well how much damage can i do here and i realized i could do 19 or 20 out of hand with six mana because I double shadow step some things and SI7 agent and what and I shadow casted the turn before to get another one cost SI7 agent and it was just insane the amount of burst that could suddenly be done with a deck that to me when I initially looked at it didn't look like that bursty of a deck it looked more like a like an early board control than late game you know just go face with all your minions type of deck but no I I, I was able to burst down pretty easily with it too it's it's innocuous, man. I, I found in the few games I've already played with this, I've, I've found myself having to just play a South Sea captain just by itself just to get some pressure on board. But then <laughs> you get lucky sometimes. You, you top deck a South Sea deckhand, and all of a sudden, it, you're just like, oh, man, I had more burst than I thought, like you said. I've been uh, counting lethal way earlier than I think I should be because of that reason. <laughs> Yeah, you you definitely have to evaluate how much damage you can do every turn with this deck because it's 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 just it's not obvious, right? Like there's a lot of tricks and stuff to getting all that damage out with the shadow stepping and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So we're gonna be doing a triple headed chicken stream tomorrow where we'll be tri piloting a, a deck. Are we doing this deck, guys? I'm into doing this, and maybe we could do a little bit of hunter too or something. We could try a few of these decks out and and get it going because I think they're I think they're all kind of interesting and and cool in their own ways i love it non-committal let's play everything i'm in <laughs> i'm oh, yeah. always on board with uh with us playing rogue because i just i have so much to learn in that class like it's it is very tricky and complicated as i as i think blizzard wants it to be so yeah the more rogue practice we get in with uh three heads i'm i'm on i'm on board with awesome awesome so if everyone wants to tune into that we're going live 3 p.m eastern time twitch.tv slash tv and the vod will be up for patrons afterwards um any, anyways, yeah, there's a lot of different decks to play. We're going to be continuing to cover decks week after week like we always do. Um, but go anywhere. Any of your normal fan sites. Disguised Toast is, I think, killing it right now with keeping their decks updated with, with who who's playing it, what rank they've achieved, and, mm -hmm. uh, and so on and so forth. And I think Disguised Toast is the best for um, finding the brand new hot streamer deck, right? Uh, or the brand new rank one legend deck, but uh, I also really like HS Replay right now a lot. HS Replay dot net is is the jam. Um, yeah, I mean you kind of have to wait a couple so days. So much. For, yeah, you have to wait a couple days for the for the info to kind of settle down after or something like this, a big change. Because right now it, even if you look at only the last three days, you're still getting that one pre nerf day, and they don't have like let me just see the last 24 hours type mm -hmm. of thing just yet. So. You got to, and then otherwise, I think their standard, if you don't have the premium, is 30 days. So it's not going to be completely up to date right after a big change, but mm -hmm. lots of cool decks there. Yep. Well, I like using that site specifically just because it kind of gives me an insight into what people are playing like across the board, right? So I can actually take a look at that and go, oh, okay, people are messing around with this. Like if I look at this deck, what would I change? And like, how is this deck evolving and stuff? So I find like, when you look at sites like Disguise Toast or Hearthpone or, you know, wherever it is that you get your decks from, you get like the, the final finished version most of the time. Whereas like if you look at all the popular decks and what people are playing and you can filter by class and all that kind of stuff, you can be like, okay, I want to play Shaman what are the shaman decks that are going on right now? Like, what are people toying around with? And it, it kind of lets you get in on the deck building side of things and kind of learn from other people and see what they're doing as they progress through creating a deck as opposed to, you know, the final finished product, which it's, it's kind yeah. of hard to learn from because you don't know where they started. Mm -hmm. uh, so Mush Potatoes in the chat just kind of reiterated what I said, which is if you have the free subscription, it's you can only sort by 30 days. 
But mm-hmm. even with the free, you can click the trending tab at the top, and that is always just here's decks that are gaining popularity over the last 48 hours. So even with the free, you can still uh, you can still look at that. Um, mm-hmm. So it's but I I feel like this is a service worth paying for because oh, it is me too. kind I of amazing. Yeah, what, the, yeah, what they're doing. And again, not a sponsor. Yeah, not sponsored. No, by yeah, them, totally unsponsored. Yep, they just, just they have a really good like. product. <laughs> However, HS Replay, if you're listening, we will gladly take your money. <laughs> sure, yes, yeah, we, we can will. work with you. But that would be a bad business decision because we're already doing it for free. Uh, (laughs) Anyways, uh, before we wrap this up with some emails, we have patrons to thank over at patreon.com slash TAC. Uh, As as we have mentioned before, this is what we do for a living. Not not just Angry Chicken. There's other shows. Although, wouldn't that be cool? (laughs) It was just Angry Chicken. Um, But uh, if you enjoy this show, if you like what we're we're doing here and you want to support Dills, you want to support Jocelyn, you can uh, stomach supporting me. Go over to patreon.com slash TAC and uh, send a dollar or two our way. This episode, we wanted to thank Justin G, Johnny S, uh, Cade C, Alicia D, and Derek J. J, two Js on uh, Derek there. Um, and uh, don't forget, we are working towards our next goal of having Raven join us as a monthly contributor guest host to The Angry Chicken. So go over there, and if that sounds awesome, support us. And if you like the show, support us. And if you don't like the show, I'll still take your money, just like Hearthstone Replay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's uh, wrap the show up with some emails. Hello. Hello, it's me. Hello. Um, just quickly, did you get my message? Yep. Oh. Hello, brother. <laughs> you can send your emails to tacpodcast at gmail.com. Claygore starts us off this week and says, Greetings, grumpy game birds. I don't think we've gotten that one before. I like that. <laughs> like it a lot. Uh, so I have been thinking about Druid, and I'd like to play Devil's Advocate. Don't you mean Druid's Advocate, Claygore? Uh, we have all seen this before. There will probably be many more decks that dominate the ladder because they emerge as the quote-unquote best deck uh, that quickly pushes players to higher ranks. So doesn't it stand to reason that if so many people are playing this deck, then it must be a really popular deck isn't that exactly what it means everyone plays the deck equals very popular deck why would team five want to nerf nerf uh, such a popular deck i know you have already talked about several valid arguments such as stifled design space things feeling overly samey and long-term health of the game etc yeah let's just throw all of those things out those are not important <laughs> talking points at all uh however in blizzard's defense if they nerf such a popular deck then wouldn't they be negatively impacting the majority of their players and that feels bad as we always say but everything feels bad to someone when do we stop letting these feelings control the game we all love am i missing something that should be glaringly obvious uh so i'm poking funny at claygore but you you make a good point i get this this i can completely understand how you kind of arrive at this as like well it's if it's good and everyone's playing it aren't you taking something away from the majority of the player base and that is a certain way to look at it but if i had to point to one thing that i would say is glaringly obvious it's design philosophy and i would say that that is not team five's design philosophy that their goal is not to have a have one specific deck or one specific class overly represented that their that their goal at the end of the day is have as much of a split between all nine classes of the game as they can realistically accomplish i think the the kind of glaringly obvious point here that I would say is that just because it's a very popular deck doesn't necessarily mean people are having fun while they're playing it. I think a lot of people played Druid specifically, not necessarily because they were having fun, but because it was such a powerful deck that you felt punished for playing anything else. So I think the punishment for playing something else is where the feels bad moment comes in. And if you actually took the players that are having fun playing Druid, they're still going to be playing Druid now, even after Innovate was changed, right? But if you look at all the other people who are playing just for powerful decks, they're going to move to the next most powerful deck. And yeah, that's that, how uh, they have fun. They have fun playing power. Yeah. They don't necessarily care if it's Druid. The, the, the problem with this argument is that if, if it was just popular because people enjoyed it, mm-hmm. then there wouldn't be this fluctuation every time something in the game changes where then suddenly it's just the best deck is the most popular again. Uh, it would be the funnest deck is the most popular and you wouldn't change it because the win rate of a fun deck isn't necessarily ever going to be a problem. But because it's weird how the most popular deck has always been 
the <laughs> highest win rate deck. Is it is it really taking something away from those people, or are we taking actually away from people the ability to play the deck that they find fun when we allow a deck to kind of run roughshod all over the rest of the ladder? So you know, think of Undertaker Hunter, and then think of like at that time everyone was playing it, but did we all want to be playing it? That's I think you know <laughs> that argument it doesn't really hold water that everyone was just having so much fun playing a turn one one two that continued to grow the rest of the game. We were just doing it because if we were going to play Hearthstone, we didn't want to feel like <clears throat> we were just going to lose all of our games, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're actually, by having a deck that is overly dominant, we are getting eight other decks taken away from us. So even though you might make the argument that, oh, we took Druid away from the 38% of the players who were playing it. No, no, we took from the 60-whatever percent of the other people, we took all their decks away by having Druid be that powerful. So we're actually by bringing it in line, giving more players more things. Mm -hmm. uh, because you give all those other players back their decks, right? Yeah. Which they felt That's like they could That's a couldn't really play. good way to look at it. Mm -hmm. all, and all obviously resting on the fact that, or the assumption that the change is successful, which it's too early to tell. But it's looking good in the first two days. Yeah, sure, exactly. Like sudden, suddenly people are back to experimenting, right? And trying mm -hmm. different things. And that's yeah. what... People are playing with the Death Knights, which I think was the biggest part of Frozen Throne that got missed, right? Like not a lot of people were experimenting with what the cool new Death Knights could do because why would you when Jade was just so powerful? Hey, hey, Jade was playing plenty of Death Knights. Well, yeah, that's like the change yeah. that happened. <laughs> yeah, that one Death Knight was seeing tons and tons of play. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, like right now we're seeing a competitive deck with Rexar in it. Um, mm -hmm. And that, it's you know, and we saw that in the tournament meta because everyone just banned Druid, right? The tournament mm -hmm. meta was actually really fun. And I was really enjoying all the tournaments because that is not the world we live in on ladder. That is a world where mm -hmm. you ban out Druid, right? So, and you saw people who tried to target Druid were getting punished heavily because of that strategy, which co clearly didn't work. Yeah. So, you know, this was just, it was the right thing to do. And, you, yeah, you can look at it as taking something away from, What's essentially still a minority of the player base, or you can look at it as giving things to the majority of the player base, which I think is the better way to look at it. Yeah. So yeah, yeah if you were missing something glaringly obvious, it's probably that, Claygore. Just <laughs> they were still technically the minority. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you're also not wrong. It is a matter of opinion. Uh, I just think uh, the at least the, the vocal majority of Hearthstone's opinion is different, and it seems so is Team Team Fives. But um, anyways, moving along, who's next, Dills? Uh, we got Justin who says, hey, churlish chicks. I was watching some, that's when I got to look up, by the way. Uh, I was watching <laughs> some October Brawl and how the streamers had to basically start with a fresh account, were restricted in certain abilities to obtain new cards, and build it up over time. It looked like a lot of fun. It reminded me a lot of Diablo 3 and every season where players can start over from the beginning. Race for leaderboards, top finishes. Is this something that could be integrated into Hearthstone? Perhaps it has a separate ladder of players just doing this kind of thing, which is what happens with D3 with limits on what you can get in terms of packs. This would be really fun, I think, is to have a, a seasonal type of Hearthstone thing where you, you essentially start with a fresh account, right? Um, and you could even use your same account and just, if you join the season, you it kind of brings you back to a, a beginning type card pool and then you have to open some, some packs. One thing I don't like about their thing, though, is that they can't disenchant cards. Um, mm. Because, you know, I get it. Maybe you could even put a limit on disenchanting and enchanting. But uh, it just, to me, it's like... I don't know. It seems like, weird because disenchanting and enchanting cards is part of the game. So I don't really, really understand. Huge part of the game. Yeah, yeah, I don't really understand why they put that restriction on it. But Well, they like, gifted a bunch of packs. But I think the idea is they didn't want them to just end up like all making like the same, the same thing. style deck. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they wanted to see some variety. So, I mean, I kind of get it, but I think if you if you were to open this up to the player base, you know, disenchanting and enchanting would be part of the strategy, right? Yeah. And uh, try, figuring out how to build up your collection as fast as possible. And it'd be really cool to have uh, little milestones you could hit where, like, let's say it was a three-month season or something like that, which I think would be about right. That's kind of mm -hmm. in, what Diablo does. I think that's about the length season, of Diablo, right? yeah. So you could have, like, each month you get, you know, one free arena run for that account, and then... Uh, after each month, depending on how many games you played or something like that, you get a bonus amount of packs. So it encourages people to just play a lot on their accounts too. There's there's a lot of cool things that could be done. This would I would play the hell out of this. I would mm -hmm. definitely be into it. Yeah. I, I I really enjoy playing on my Asia and EU accounts and trying to figure out how to make a decent deck. 
Uh, obviously, I'm never really <laughs> above like rank 15, so it's a little different over there. But well, yeah, because I think the cool idea about this is that everyone would be in that same space, right? Like everyone sure. that is competing in this like restricted kind of start from scratch season would be on the same ladder doing the same stuff. So I think that's where it comes in. And that's why it's not quite the same to just play on EU or Asia. It's the closest thing we have right now to this experience, I think. But it's nice when everyone's on the same like level well, you, playing. You can yeah. even throw the ladder <laughs> idea the start, out. They anyway. don't even have to rank up on the, the same mm -hmm. sort of ladder. Their ranking up can be done totally different. You could just queue in to other players doing the thing. And then the way you kind of find out your rank is, you know, after a certain point, they say like, this person has earned this uh, percentage of the collection. This person has won this percentage of their games. You could have winners in different categories and things like that. That would be super cool. Yeah, like which is also kind of what you see in Diablo. Like you, you see people who have gotten the highest Paragon level, and then you also see things like uh, highest, you know, tier of of clears and things like that when. You know, doing so. There's all sorts of different, you know, best gear achieved. There's all sorts. I've of never done a Diablo do. season, so I wasn't sure that what? how they did it. But yeah, oh, no, Diablo's not my jam, man. Uh, okay. <laughs> That's true. But it's, seasons are really fun. I'm, I'm gonna jump through the I, internet. I played it. I played the the story, <laughs> I but know. I don't do the seasons. <laughs> what is what is a video game podcast if if I, if people don't get indignant about opinions that are different from their own? Uh, <laughs> It's, it's two things. It's a different experience than Diablo you're probably used to, and I find it pretty fun. I although I flame out pretty quick on it. Like I, <laughs> yeah. I get really into it for a few weeks. A day and I'm or like, two. Cool, did it. Yep. Uh, two things. One, I can't believe I didn't think about this. Uh, Justin, who wrote in, you're blowing my mind. I want this in the game in the worst way. And two, question, Dills and Jocelyn, is this something you would be happy paying for if we got to keep the cards at the end of the month? Well, because I could hmm. see this being like a subscription <laughs> service that Hearthstone launches. Like you pay but monthly. But if I did it on my main account, I wouldn't really need all those cards at the end of every no. month. But it would be kind of cool to just get rewarded some dust and packs to go into your regular account at the end. Yeah, but know? but I, yeah, I, I still would, would like the dust. Yeah, I think that would be the way it would translate. Yeah, as my, it, I, I still would like to bolster my collection, whether it's uh, it's not. Uh, sustainable or not sustainable not a good kind of return on my investment because i have a lot of cards already i would still like i don't know to feel like i'm still bolstering my collection at the end so i i don't know i'm thinking about this i'm like i'd pay 15 bucks 20 bucks a month for this to opt into a ladder well, like this well, yeah i mean if they had like a buy-in and then at the end you idea. always got more than that return then sure it, you know people would be essentially sacrificing time to get a little bit extra value out of their cash right 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 i don't know this just sounds awesome and something like i think i'd really enjoy I love I love having a reason to play suboptimal decks, and <laughs> and an arena. Well, you'd be playing against other suboptimal decks. Exactly. exactly the idea, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So right. it's it's not like what you do now when you kind of force yourself into a bad spot by playing with a free to play account. Instead, everyone's a free to play account, yeah. right? So and you're kind of building your way up. They they could even match make not based on. Uh, not based on win rates. They could match make based on like collection percentages, right? And things like that. So, yep. you know, you play against other so people cool. who have similar collection percentages as you instead of, uh, so rad. instead of win rates. God. Yeah. Okay. So, so I, this, this doesn't knock me off of my campaign that I want arena improvements, like all of them you could ever think of ever mentioned on this show, but this is definitely like a type of limited Hearthstone that I've never thought of. And I want immediately now. After having it mentioned on <laughs> yeah, this show. Yeah, I thought this was a really cool idea when I read it. I was like, mm, yep, this could be mm -hmm. fun. <laughs> yep, please. I like, the, I like the total collection reset idea and also the idea uh, without actually touching my stuff that yeah. I paid for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I like the, the total like everyone start from scratch idea every once in a while, however long you end up doing it. And uh, I also like the idea of measuring people's kind of like ranks against each other in ways that aren't just straight up like, I'm first, you're second, we're legend. There's numbers like uh, saying like collection percentage and, you know, even like crazy things like they've been sending out in the monthly, like your month in Hearthstone thing, like most minions played, most spells cast, like some yeah. sort of running total of that would be super cool too. Most value gained from a card. Hey, it turns out Yeti because you've been playing this weird new mode that we have. Like <laughs> 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 yeah, no, I, uh, those, those stats things have been really crazy because I had, when I got the last one, it said your highest win streak was 15 games. And I was like, when did I win 15 games in a row? But it was kind of like one of those cool things to be like, wow, I did that. Oh, yeah. sweet. You know, cause you don't I really realize it in the moment. For some reason 
I got one in July, but not for August tier. Uh, I might have got buried in your spam. I got another one oh, too. Maybe. But, but yeah, but like, yeah, you could do things like, uh, you know, when you're on a three game win win streak, you play against somebody else with a three game win streak. You don't worry about stars and anything like. Like, you can just find all these cool ways to do stuff. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, I just I just want more ways to play Hearthstone, honestly. So, any cool <laughs> idea, I'm on board. Agreed. All right, Jocelyn, final email for today. Uh, this one comes to us from Jesus Freak, who says, "Hello, brilliant bright wings. Oh, thank you. Short and sweet here. Do you have any idea of what Hearthstone event is going to be held at BlizzCon this year? No. I looked everywhere. I could not find an official announcement, but." I also watched the um, unboxing of the BlizzCon swag thing and the virtual ticket announcement and all that kind of stuff. The basically the BlizzCon 2017 hype stream that they did last week, and <laughs> they mentioned offhandedly that there's going to be a Hearthstone team invitational event. So there will be Hearthstone esports there, just not HCT. Gotcha. Yeah, it's going to be popular streamers playing as other popular streamers. Basically, I, yes. I, in a, I in a team based happen. in a team based environment, yeah. Yeah. So I there haven't... is some sort of team event. Is the only thing I could find, and I couldn't find. I just kind of like heard that. I think it was like Michelle Morrow, um, who is the voice of Illyria in Hearthstone, and like she says, "Oh yeah," and I'm really looking forward to the Hearthstone team event. I was like, "Whoa, wait, what?" I'm sorry, <laughs> what? Huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when did this happen? Oops, and so not I'm cleared. Not sure if she was supposed to say anything about it, but yeah. Yeah. I, so I... there was that little drop, but. That's all we know. I reached out to Hearthstone PR today because of this question. I'm like, I haven't actually thought of this in a very long time. And I went and checked the schedule. I'm like, nope, there ain't Jack on the schedule for November. And then I, hey, PR, uh, is that any, am I insane or has nothing been announced? <laughs> They're like, no, nothing has been announced. I'm just like, I didn't, I didn't catch it in my trap. Damn. <laughs> so, yeah, nothing has been officially announced. But it sounds like, it sounds like good old Michelle Morrow may have let something slip a little bit. But yeah. Of course, they have that amazing stage. There's no way they're not utilizing the the actual freaking tavern stage and having some competitive Hearthstone go on. And and this way they also, I mean, if, if it is an invitational, they get the curate who comes up, so they're going to get the biggest damn names. Everyone, mm-hmm. Everyone's going to get hyped about it. I'm sure it's going to be a fun event, as long as uh, the connection holds out. <laughs> pretty sure at BlizzCon, the connection will be fine. I'm, I'm, you, I'm pretty <laughs> sure. You never know. You never know. The worst, the worst can happen. We have had, we have had a downtime at BlizzCon. Just uh, what two years ago, we had like a two-hour downtime period during uh, the Heroes mm-hmm. tournament because you know hardware fails, man. You can't yep. always do something about you it. You never know. <laughs> yep. Well, that's gonna wrap it up for this episode. I'd like to remind everyone again to send your emails to tackpodcast at gmail dot com and uh, continue blowing my mind with ideas uh, to get added to this game that I'm now going to, like, froth of the mouth over. Thank you for that (laughs) again, Justin. I really want this in the game. Uh, Thanks again to our patrons supporting us over at patreon.com slash TAC. Thank you to our producers, Declan H., Peter Williams, Michael N., Sean C., and Johnny S. You guys are awesome. Uh, You can find the whole back catalog of the Angry Chicken episodes either at amove.tv or youtube.com slash amove.tv. We have shirts available at shirts.amove.tv and uh, cups, glasses, mugs, that kind of stuff at etched.amove.tv. The show's Twitter is at TAC Podcast. That's where we uh, post updates like new episodes or if we change the recording time. So if you want to keep up to date with TAC, that's the best way to do so. And uh, you can usually catch us Tuesday nights at 4 p.m. Eastern on twitch.tv slash amove.tv. Uh, Dills, you're doing a lot of things around the web. You're always playing Hearthstone, it seems like. Where can folks find you? Uh, follow me on Twitter. I'm at Willie Dills. My stream is twitch.tv slash Willie Dills. And uh, unfortunately, I will be out of town this coming weekend, but you'll still get some IRL Vegas streams featuring Justin Robert Young as we go fi- find, our, find our way around wrestling and, and I guess a big Diamond Club event is going on <laughs> there too. So there's going to be lots of fun things happening, so check that out. But uh, until the until the weekend, you'll see me playing Hearthstone and testing out some of these new fun decks. So ch- come check that out. And then if you are curious about the wrestling podcast, it's called One Nine Hundred Wrestling. You can find it uh, anywhere you can find other podcasts. Man, that sounds like a good time. I wish I was in Vegas next week. Oh my god, it's gonna be so fun. Same Sex Mary's playing. They have some big oh, nice. uh, like music festival type show going on. It's gonna be crazy. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, Jocelyn, do you have anything as awesome as Dill's going on? No, you uh, should just go skip to you. Me neither. <laughs> um. 
Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Twitch. I'm at Just Plays. You can find me right here on Twitch.tv slash TV every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern for my general gaming podcast, which is The Gamers In. And you can check out TV for links to other stuff I do, including Embrace the Spoilers with Garrett. We just spoiled it. Uh, spoiler, it's scary. Like, very. <laughs> so... <laughs> yes, I never thought I would bond with my good friend Jocelyn over a scene in a movie that we both admitted almost made us crap our pants. Yep. Mm. So if that sounds you know, it's like funny, I don't really times. like horror movies, but I like stuff like like it. Like that that is the type of horror movie like very psychological, very creepy. I just don't like uh we're just going to jump scare you and blah, blah, blah. Like jump scares are obviously going to be there, but there, needs oh, there to be was something... a lot of jump scares in this yeah, one, <laughs> but there needs to be something that makes me then leave and be like, Oh my God. Like I need to be creeped out for the rest of the day. And... Oh, I was, cre- uh, I'm still <laughs> creeped out and I saw yeah. it days ago. So <laughs> I got creeped out in the middle of recording that episode because Jocelyn yeah, pointed too. out oh, things that I missed. Thing? Oh, dude, I haven't been able to stop thinking about that stupid freaking eye thing. I couldn't fall asleep last night because I was like, I need to go put a light on in the bathroom so I can see if there's anything like standing in my bedroom door. <laughs> yes. Wonderful. Well, everyone go check that out. Yeah, it's called Embrace the Spoilers. Uh, I'm on Twitter if you want to follow me at Garrett Art and every podcast I do, including that one, this one, my hero show into the Nexus. Kyle's coming back this week. Hooray. I need met I need support in Heroes of the Storm right now, so I'm glad Kyle's returning. Uh, go check that out over at amove.tv. That will wrap it up for this week's episode. Get out there and enjoy the new patch, everybody. It's a brave new Hearthstone world, and if that cheesy cinematic is to be believed, Hearthstone is home. Until next week's episode, job's done. Job's done. Job's done. Yes! <laughs> <laughs>